The singing and the cheering you can hear around me is from the Ecuador fans who have just beaten the hosts. After an extremely controversial build-up, the football is finally up and running. I'm outside the Albait Stadium, the remarkable arena in the middle of the desert, designed to look like an enormous Bedouin tent, and it's just hosted the opening match. It couldn't have gone much worse for Qatar. The 2022 Men's World Cup is underway. Going behind the scenes of the biggest prize in football, this is World Football in Qatar on the BBC World Service. Welcome to the first bonus edition of World Football in Qatar. Hello from me, John Bennett. Qatar's footballers have prepared for their World Cup debut for 12 years. They've been in training camp for around five months. The Asian Cup holders were hoping to make a dream start. In the end, though, it was a bit of a nightmare against Ecuador. They were beaten 2-0 by the South Americans. Ecuador's star player, Enna Valencia, scored both goals, one from the penalty spot. Qatar were totally outplayed. Ecuador had a goal disallowed controversially by the video assistant referee after only three minutes. And many of the fans, the home fans, left early. There were plenty of empty seats as the second half progressed. Let's hear from some of the supporters who were here for this opening match of the World Cup. Very happy today, very happy. 2-0 to Ecuador. The next game, Friday, for the Netherlands, one more winner. Awesome, fantastic. It was a lot of fun. Could it have gone much better than that? I mean, uh, the if, way you started. If we would have kept the first goal. Yes. Oh, yeah, VAR controversy. I, yeah. I cheered Renew. so loud, and then I was like, oh no. But, but you didn't have to wait for long until no. you actually right. scored. Right, right, right. It wasn't too much longer. It was a good game. And what did you make of the whole occasion? You are playing the host Qatar. Was it the noise you expected? Was it the excitement you expected? Is you it? guys were making a lot, a lot of noise. I know, it was great. It was, you know, across from each other. So that made it really fun. It was like a back and forward. So I thought that was really fantastic. It, it's, it's been really great so far, the whole trip. I, I think the team fed off the energy. because There was a lot of Ecuador fans there. I wanted to talk to you because you've got a replica World Cup trophy in your hands that yes. you're waving. Yes. In the, inside the stadium. You don't think Ecuador can win that, do you? Of course I could. <laughs> of course I do. As a most death that Ecuador will win. I'm 100% sure they got a different team. They have a young team. They actually play easy today. Amazing. I thought that's not going to happen. But you see, we achieved. Really happy. Did you expect your team to play that well? I mean, Qatar hardly had no. a chance. No, no, actually, no. <laughs> I have to say the truth. I have my low expectations, just in case. I didn't want to go home broken hearted. So it's all right. I'm really excited. And now you play Senegal and you play the Netherlands. Yep. Your husband's here. Yep. You just told me he's from the Netherlands. Still, let's see you next week. Huh? <laughs> Might be the ex-husband next week. <laughs> How's it going to be? What's it going to be like? You've got to play each other now. Um, yeah. But uh, we'll let the kids decide. Well, I don't know. I'm hoping for a draw. I want you to stay uh, together. No, 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 no. <laughs> they have to keep this level. I hope it's not only because of the first match. Huh? So let's see. <laughs> All the best. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you, guys. So that's what the fans made of it. And outside the ground, we've just bumped into World Football's Pat Nevin, who was inside watching the opening game. Pat's a, a former Everton, Chelsea and Scotland winger, of course, regular voice on the show. So, Pat, what, what did you make of that as an opening game? Qatar were poor, weren't they? Well, first of all, it was a fantastic opening ceremony. Kind of went downhill from there, if you were a <laughs> Qatari. Um, I was a bit disappointed in them. I, th- I, I, I was expecting a bit better. Um, Ecuador started well, they played at a high tempo, and the Qatari team didn't have the technical ability to pay, play for, against that. Also, physicality, they mm. were, weren't close enough. And in the World Cup, when you come to this level, you, you need the technical ability, the physicality, tactically you need to be good as well. And they, I'm afraid they were found wanting in just about all of those areas. And, you know, that can happen. I don't think it was any lack of effort. I think the fitness was good. If I'm going to try and find some positives for the Qataris, um, but it, it was a shame for them they were outclassed and I think 2-0 they should be quite pleased with that even though if you look at the ball statistics was it 5 shots and goals against 6 shots and goals but um, certainly Ecuadorians took their foot off the gas they had the game won they managed it well for most of the second half had they 
needed to go and lift it again, I'm sure they could have lifted it again. Uh, so it's going to be a, a tough couple of games coming up for the Qatari team because Senegal ain't bad and the Dutch are very, very good. And by that time, I think there'll be a bit of tiredness coming into the Qatari squad. What did you make of the atmosphere? Because I think one of the big stories will be the amount of empty seats there were as, as, as the second half progressed. I don't think I've seen that before at an opening match of a World Cup. There is a problem with opening matches in World Cups. Uh, this is my third one that I've done. And uh, certainly both of them I had problems with before this because you tend not to get fans in. You tend to get VIPs. You tend to get mates of people who are in high places. They're not really the people you want. To, to produce a good atmosphere and to be fair there was a, a good deal of um, Ecuadorian fans there that's fine um, they made a little bit of a noise uh, there were a group of fans that were and I'm putting that in inverted commas Qatari fans who made a little bit of a noise behind <laughs> the goal uh, they looked like the ultras could have been that good because the ultras didn't come back for the second half or half of them didn't yeah, half of them left didn't they half of those half ultras of them left. the goal and I, I was doing a commentary for BBC Radio 5 Live and I was taken aback that after half time, so many empty seats were there. So, you know, maybe this is the modern way of things that certain people come along, they've had the selfie, they've seen the show beforehand, teams get beat, well, I'm away home, the traffic's bad. But that, that's a disappointment. And I, I think the Qataris will be very disappointed in that because they wanted to show that, like a lot of people in the Middle East, there's a passion for football. Middle Eastern football's passionate. You know, lots of countries around here are passionate. Didn't look like it in the second half tonight, and that's a real shame. Maybe in, in the next games, maybe the real Qatari fans will turn up and we'll, we'll get a little bit better. But that was a wee bit of a letdown, I'll have to be honest. Now, one of the things we were warned about when we headed to this World Cup was the heat and what impact that could have on the players. This was a, an evening kickoff, 7 pm local kickoff, so it was a bit cooler anyway. But one of my main take, one of my main takeaways from being inside the ground was I was chilly. I, I was cold. I, I put a jacket on. I, I never expected that at the Qatar World Cup. Was it the same for you? Were you a bit cold? Were you? Well, off? first of all, I've just come from Scotland, so um, it's a wee <laughs> bit warmer still. <laughs> it's in Scotland, uh, but yes, it, it's a little bit chilly. And I would say what really jumped at me. I thought it would be warmer than this, but it's perfect conditions for playing football. So it's not an excuse for any players playing at this time of night if it's going to be like this. However, why did the Qataris move their game to a night game? They would have much more suited their players who are very, very acclimatised to playing in hotter conditions. So that actually didn't work for them very well. I know they wanted to you know, be in the spotlight, and they were in the spotlight for a very, very short period of time. So I think decisions were made that didn't actually help the players today. But for everyone else in the World Cup, I think if you're certainly Northern Hemisphere, you're wanting night games. I think it'll make a big, big difference. And the air conditioning as well. That's what you can hear whirring in the background. The air conditioning was quite drafty, wasn't it? It, it was. Actually, it was a windy day here. There were sandstorms in the way out. I, I wanted to take a picture, <laughs> but they don't take very good pictures, sandstorms, said the Scotsman who's never seen one before. Um, but yeah, it was quite noticeable. I didn't actually think it would have needed any air conditioning inside the stadium tonight. If that was one of the reasons for a little bit of a chilly feeling around there then they can turn it off you don't need it <laughs> keep it for the the games in the afternoons in case it's needed for them away from the opening game the big story over the last 24 hours the injury for Karim Benzema that the Ballon d'Or winner has got a thigh problem and he's out of the World Cup it's yet another injury I mean a few days ago Sadio Mane who finished second in the, the Ballon d'Or standings he pulled out he won't be playing for Senegal how upsetting! How upset are you on, on Karim Benzema's behalf? Because he's one of the greats. You want the greats at the World Cup. I know, and you wonder if he will have enough, another opportunity. And that's a real sadness. But, you know, if you have a World Cup in the middle of the season... Now, to be fair, it's not the middle of the season, it's the start of the season. And people are saying, wait a minute, you should be able to cope. Now, for a lot of the players, however, it's been a very, very tight, concentrated season so far. The other thing which you cannot forget, and, and I've had this with international competitions before... If you get injured just before it, there isn't that four, five, six week re mm. run up where you can recover from injuries. I recovered from a, a, a broken leg, as it were. It was a fib that was cracked and I still played in a Euros. There is no time. Got an injury, you're out. And that's, that's so many good players are now missing from this. That's the real sadness. And as we look forward after this World Cup, you have to consider that. 
if you ever want to have a, a World Cup at this time of the year again. I know it takes out a lot of countries that you know have perfectly good rights to have World Cups, you know, but from certain parts of the world, when you do that, it's going to affect the quality of players that you've got purely because there's no lead-up team because the major leagues are still playing. Pat, I know you've got to rush off because it's 35 kilometres to Doha, but just stay there for a second because I want to talk to you about a big game coming up because the eyes of the world will be on the Khalifa International Stadium on Monday when Iran line up to face England. Life in Iran since mid-September has been dominated by a wave of dramatic anti-government protests sparked by the death of a 22-year-old woman, Masha Amini, who had been detained by Iran's morality police for allegedly breaking their strict hijab rules. Well, we met some Iranian fans in Doha's Souk Wakif area who were wearing T-shirts bearing the slogans Free Iran and Stand with Iranian Women. Here's what they had to say. We used to use football for be happy, find some sort of glory in the football. But nowadays it has no sense for us to be happy anymore. We are here to support just the people in Iran, not the soccer team, because we didn't see any action from them to support Iranian people. We are waiting for them at the first game to see some actions to support the Iranian people. If they don't do anything, we're not supporting the Iranian team. People, they don't like them, especially uh, in recent selfies that they posted as a sort of official photos of the team, that they were laughing and they were like mimicking each other, something like that. On the day a 10-year-old kid got killed, it was really, you know, hurt people. They shouldn't be happy. They shouldn't be happy because we're not happy. I'm not happy. It's a mixed feeling. In one hand, my my people are suffering back home. At the same time, I feel this is my team elite. This is my national team. It's not Islamic Republic of Iran. It's an Iran soccer team. So I, I feel that these guys are my guy. But I'm waiting to see if these guys are going to support real Iranian people. Soccer player in back home in the club, they score. They are not do a lot of happiness, so they, they do solidarity. For the national anthem, they can be quiet, they can be, you, you can show your support. I want these guys to show that they are supporting Iranian people. I don't want these guys to be like, oh, there is something there, like we are in football. No, there are things are together right now. That's, that's what I'm expecting from these guys. Most of these players, I believe, they got energy from the fans to play better. When no one really likes you or many people wish you to lose, you don't get that positive vibe to fight for your team. So I think we are at that point that we don't care if they won and probably if they lose also, people they don't gonna say any, that much about them. As a woman, what kind of feelings do you have at the moment as an Iranian woman here? I'm so proud of myself that I'm, I'm an Iranian woman. I just want to support them because we have the bravest woman in the whole the world. What do you think the atmosphere will be like when Iran play England? We're here, we decided to just make some noises at the Iranian anthem. So you're going to boo the Iranian yeah, anthem? Yeah, for sure, we're going to do that. We're going to, because it's not our anthem. It's not, it's for Islamic regime. Maybe some of the pro, uh, you know, state fans coming here, Maybe it's going to be some sort of, you know, conflict with, between the fans. So it's not a joyable thing. If my team care for the Iranian people, I want them to win, to be proud of being Iranian. But if they don't care for my people, I don't care about the results. So for now, I give them a benefit of a doubt. But if there is no action, no, that's not going to be the thing that I'm going to care. Pat Nevin, this is more than a football match, isn't it? This game for a run against England. Over the years, I mean, I've been involved in football matches and I've covered a lot of football matches that have had political stories and they've had stories that make you feel painful about the actual game and you understand the, the lack of importance of a game of football in these situations. I don't know if I've ever felt it more than I feel about this game. Um, what is happening to... You know, not just the women in Iran, but the men who are standing up for the women in the position just now is frightening. It's really, really frightening and it's horrifying what's going on just now. Um, I know there was a chat, uh, a lot of people possibly, because the, the, the line is, if you do the sign of cutting your hair, you're standing beside them. 
I have to say I'd be delighted if Harry Kane scored a goal and went away and pretended to cut his hair. They're not supposed to have political slogans, but, you know, for their quality. Because everyone seems to talk about it. We even had it here today, talking about it before the game, saying it's all about equality. Well, equality means treating everyone the same. And I think it's been a very, very upsetting thing for a lot of people. The game will go ahead. Whether Harry Kane actually wears the armband or not, I don't know. There is a suggestion he may get booked if he does. I hope he does anyway. And because it's making the point that you know, a lot of people are suffering just now and uh, the rest of the world is looking so we shall see where it goes just now there's a game of football to be played and remember for a lot of these players I understand this look they want to play the football game they've worked hard for it be they Iranian players or be they English players or be they anyone and you have to remember that but it's impossible now to keep sport uh, and politics apart it's just impossible and statements have to be made sometimes and uh, I kind of hope they're made. And then after that, I hope we have a great game of football. <laughs> and being a Scotsman, I'm not going to tell you who I want to win. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. Enjoy your travels around Doha. Brilliant to speak to you again. The other match in Group B sees the USA take on Wales. No player started more matches for the USA in qualifying than the midfielder, Kellen Acosta. The Los Angeles FC midfielder has a mixed race heritage and endured a tough upbringing in the predominantly white city of Plano in Texas. He's been telling World Football's Manny Jasmi how it feels to be representing his roots at a first World Cup finals. Oh man, it's a, it's a surreal feeling. Um, it's a proud moment for myself and my family. And just, I mean, it's huge. You, you represent something that's bigger than yourself. Representing not only a country, a community I'm from, people that look like me. It's, uh, no, it's just, it's just an amazing accomplishment. And, um, you know, I just can't wait for the tournament to get started. In terms of your community, where you're from in Texas, what, what have people been uh, saying to you? Have you received messages from the, the people you grew up with and so on? Yeah, I mean, just from, from people I haven't talked to in years, to old coaches, to, to family members, I feel like everyone's coming out of the woodworks in a positive manner. But um, no, I mean, it's been, it's been amazing how much support that I have. I mean, sometimes it, you kind of forget you know how many people around you are keeping tabs on you so it was it was really cool to see you know all the messages and texts and you know social media interactions that I've had in the, uh, in the past week or so do you also feel like you're representing people like you i know you had uh, some racism when you were growing up maybe more maybe more than i've read about um, do you feel like all those all those kids who who don't have anyone to look up to can look up to you playing at the World Cup no for sure I think my, not even on a soccer standpoint more of a dream standpoint I feel like it, you can use my story um, because I feel like I can relate to a lot of people I mean um, I'm Japanese I'm black obviously on the outside um, I have some also Hispanic heritage with my step grandpa as well so I feel like I blend in but it's more of of if you have a dream, you know, do whatever you can to achieve it. I mean, one of my dreams was to play in a World Cup, and, you know, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here right here in Doha, and, you know, if you have something, put your best foot forward and give it all that you have, and you can achieve anything you want. Can you tell us about some of the problems you had with racism and, uh, uh, and, and being discriminated against as you grew up in America? Yeah, I mean, one, just from, you know, walking down the street, you know, people are walking in front of me, they see me, they cross the street. Really? Yeah, you're talking about, I walk into a store and people ask me if I'm lost because they think I can't afford to, to be in the store. Um, whether it's my, my grandma's Asian, they're asking if I'm adopted because she's Asian. Like, oh, or she, you're, is she my nanny? Or is she, you know, something. I mean, I've, I've heard it all. Whether it's, you know, it's dark outside, people ask me, oh, where'd you go? I've been through it all, I've heard it all, and I mean, I've, I've got teammates, that have, that have, I've heard the same thing, and then it's one of those things where we need to educate people around us because if enough is enough, and, um, and I think we need to shed a light on the things that we've experienced and that I hope future generations don't have to endure that. So with your rich heritage, what were your football influences when you were growing up? My football influences, obviously from my family. I had a Brazilian coach that I looked to him as a father figure who kind of took me under his wing and really just showed me the game in a, in a different light. And so I give a lot of credit to him, Coach Z, Zikinha. Um And he's the one that really you know, made me fall in love with football. Who were your heroes? Who were the uh, posters on the wall? I had a, I had a poster of uh, different soccer players. It was, like a, it was like a collage of like David Beckham, Luis Figo, uh, Ronaldinho. 
uh, Zidane, but there was quite a few. And I'm, every day I would just kind of just look at the post and be like, man, I would, I would hope to be like them someday. And now you are. And now I'm here at the World Cup. Amazing. <laughs> just before I let you go, Gareth Bale, he, uh, <laughs> he came on, the magic man in the MLS Cup final, scored a goal in injury time at the end of extra time. Now you're facing him. What kind of shape is he in? Yeah, I mean, you saw in the final, he scored a, a point of goal in a, an important moment. I mean, he's a guy that, that we've seen his whole career that he scores big goals. And um, obviously, he played limited minutes this year, but um, you still see his quality. But, I, you know, come World Cup time, I know he's going to be ready for it. I know he has this game on Monday circled in his calendar, and I know that he's going to be prepared and prepped and ready for it. Has he been talking about it? Yeah, we've, we've had some banter in the season, and uh, right now it's a countdown. Before, it seemed like so far away, but now it's like it's World Cup time. He's ready to go. USA midfielder Kellen Acosta there. The biggest African story of the World Cup so far is the loss of Senegal striker Sadio Mane, one of the continent's greatest players, one of the world's greatest players. As they prepared for their first game against the Netherlands, we headed over to the very busy Senegal camp to get the reaction from their 2002 World Cup hero, El Hadj Jouf, and the captain, Khalidou Koulibaly. Yes, we know that it's tough, it's a tough moment for us, but... We have to keep on going, we have to keep on playing, we have to keep on playing for him because he deserves it. He wanted so bad to be here with us. Today he will, um, he will not be with us, but I hope that uh, we will make him proud of us because we, it's our objective to make him proud because uh, he really deserves to, to be with us. But uh, God decided like this and now we will do everything Monday to, to make him happy. Now we have to, to keep on going. We know that all the Africa and all the Senegal are believing on us. So we will give everything on the pitch to, to make them proud and to show that uh, Africa has uh, beautiful teams and I hope that uh, Senegal will do well, then we, everybody will be proud of us. Of course, we all sad because of the beauty of football. We, we love to see Sadio playing this World Cup and Sadio was uh, doing everything to get him ready for this World Cup. And, uh, you know, uh, all players, all big players want to shine on the World Cup. Uh, but uh, think happen. Uh, we're going to work uh, without him. We're going to do everything to making him proud. And uh, Senegal have to, uh, have to show the whole world who are the African uh, champion. And we came here to, 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 to make him happy. Sajo is out for the World Cup for, to play in football. But Sajo is never leave us. Sajo is always with us. And uh, Sajo is going to be always with us. Because before we play, he's going to call his teammate. He's going to talk to them. And why not to come? to just like uh, uh, to be with them uh, I, and I think so we don't talking about only football but Sadio to be here for, for his teammate is going to be okay, something guys, thank you. Leading the conversation on the global game this is World Football in Qatar on the BBC World Service We've moved across Doha now to the Al Rayyan International School and I'm watching a football tournament which may not have the quality of the World Cup but there's certainly all the passion, the crunching tackles, some pretty impressive goals too. This competition is all about the fans. There's an official FIFA fans tournament taking place at the end of November. This is an unofficial one. England, Mexico, one team who aren't actually at the World Cup, Bangladesh, as well as Spain and Argentina are fighting it out for the trophy. These are honestly really good games and the fans on the sidelines, as you can hear, they're getting into it as well. The tempo's impressive in the extreme heat, the same conditions that the players are going to have to contend with. It's two small outdoor AstroTurf pitches next to a sports hall and there's some history in this game taking place right now. Two old enemies, England against Argentina. And there goes the final whistle. It is another victory for Argentina against England. 3-2. It was a brilliant game. Let's catch up with some of the Argentina players. It was a hard game. Uh, I guess that uh, England is the, the team we have to beat in this tournament. Uh, they are strong, but uh, we are strong too. Tell me, do you all travel from the same place? Do you all know each other? We are from different uh, states from Argentina. 
we play uh, the last year since uh, March or April from last year. We were playing together uh, as a team. Um, there are some uh, new players that uh, came from other countries, um, Argentinians also, but uh, they live in other countries. But uh, most of the team are from Argentina, uh, closer to Buenos Aires. It's a long journey. Tell me about your World Cup experience. How, how, how difficult has it been to get here? How expensive? How many sacrifices have you had to make to, to be here to support Argentina? A lot of sacrifices. Uh, we were um, working a lot to get the, the money to be here. It's a dream for, for all of us. Uh, it's, it's magic. Uh, we, we love this uh, soccer and playing here. Uh, like our World Cup, uh, it's uh, a lot for us. Um, we appreciate the efforts of our family and friends to be here. Uh, we, we are proud of, of all our people and uh, the people who are, who are here. Is it all for Lionel Messi, to see Lionel Messi in his final World Cup? Yeah, I hope uh, he will have a a great uh, cup uh, this year uh, and that's 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 all I guess uh, I, I don't want to say the uh, other words uh, just for, for luck <laughs> yeah you don't want to jinx it <laughs> let's talk to Emiliano the goalkeeper yes my English is very bad oh no let, let's try let's try because okay. I know you made lots of sacrifices to be here can, can you tell me how, how difficult it's been to, to uh, get here from uh, Argentina many sacrifices uh, Four years, uh, I'm um, take money and I'm lost uh, very, uh, very moment for vacations, for example, or uh, buy a car or buy a department. So no holiday, no car. No, no, only only my man, only in the in the Qatar World Cup. For four years, so for four, four years, years since the four last years. World Cup in Russia, you've been thinking, yes. let's get yes. to Qatar, let's get to yes. Qatar. Qatar, Qatar, only Qatar. Sorry, but I, I'm, I'm going to, to the match. <laughs> <laughs> Emiliano's got to go. We're stopping him from playing. He's back in goal. It's Mexico against Argentina now. So they've already beaten England. Can they beat Mexico? I was holding up Emiliano from playing against Mexico. The game's just finished. The Mexicans sound very happy. Let's find out how they got on. I'm Luis Garcia and I'm from Chihuahua, Mexico. I'm Miguel Nieto. I live in San Diego, California. What is it like to be at this World Cup? You've traveled a long way. Yes, absolutely. We do it actually every uh, World Cup. So we was back on uh, Russia 2019. We have a tournament over there and now we're doing it right here. And what's it been like? You, en you enjoying Qatar? What's the experience been like? Uh, yeah, it's been um, uh, magnificent. Um, I, you know, people were saying stuff about Qatar. You know, you know things that are not true. So, uh, it's so far so so good. I mean, uh, just like any other World Cup, I've been to uh, two previous World Cups, Brazil and Russia. And it's no, no no other different than those two previous ones. So yeah, good. And you're getting to play against some of your rivals here. You played against Argentina. That's they're in your group, aren't they? In the, in, in the real thing. Yeah. So is this a chance to, to put down a put down a stamp to, to show your authority on Argentina? What happened? What was the score? Well, that was zero zero, but it was a very close game for both teams. And then not going to be about. Hopefully, we can be do, doing the same thing on the tournament. <laughs> but we see everything can happen on this uh, tournament. So. Not the same thing you win. How, how do you, how do you win think win. you're going to get on? Because for Mexico, it's all about getting to the quarterfinals. Mexico always knocked out in the last 16. Can, can you make that that fifth game? It, it, it's uh, like every four years. It's quite always. Uh, it, it's a challenge. But we hope, we hope we will make it through this time to the quarterfinals. Uh, you know, we have a hard rival rivals like Argentina and Poland. Maybe not so much uh, Saudi Arabia, with all due respect. <laughs> but we'll see what happens. Hopefully we can make it through. We don't know who we would be facing against uh, on the uh, round of 16. Hopefully it's an easy rival, but hopefully we'll make it through. So there you have it. Mexico and Argentina fans in optimistic mood ahead of the World Cup, although the Argentines were pretty wary about making any bold predictions. They don't want to jinx their main man, Lionel Messi. By the time of our next World Football in Qatar podcast, both teams will have played their opening matches. Mexico against Poland, Argentina versus Saudi Arabia in Group C, as Messi begins his quest to win the World Cup for the first time. 
We'll be hearing from Spain's World Cup winner Cesc Fabregas on his country's chances and from one of Ghana's newest recruits, Tarek Lamptey. Until then, thanks for listening and from Doha, goodbye for now.